which is a first in a while. It is. <laughs> so this afternoon's panel presentation is going to be slightly different than what we did this morning. This morning we held all questions until all of our presentations were done. We're not going to do that this time. We're going to go through each presentation and have a brief Q&A session immediately afterwards. Any questions that relate specifically to that presentation. If you ask a question that goes a little bit afield, the presenter is going to ask you to hold your question until we get to the next presentations. Okay? Afterwards, after we do all the presentations and all the little mini Q&As, we will wrap it all up with one big general question and answer to try to bring it all together and bring the vision back home. Everybody got any questions about that? Not yet. <laughs> okay. So with that, let's get started with Maxine and you kick it off for us. Okay. Thank you. I'm Maxine Maxted, sorry, with DOE. Um, we've got a panel of experts here today. I didn't think you wanted to listen to me talk for four hours, so we, <laughs> so we brought in the experts. Um, so to my left is Keila Lofton. She's a facility manager for L Basin. And then next to her is Jimmy Winkler. He is our program manager for um, EMO, uh, Environmental Management Operations on SRNS. And then you have Bill Bates. He's with the National Lab, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about dry storage. To my right is Rick Burns. He's the facility manager for H Canyon for the SRNS. And to his right is um, Eloy Salad. I can't say it. Salivar. Salivar, sorry. Um, and he's going to talk to you about our system plan, and it's basically a plan of what could we do if we had all the funding that we needed in H Canyon. So you're going to get a whole gamut of information um, about what we do in nuclear materials. And with that, I'm going to start with my presentation, which is an overview. Oh, I am so sorry, Mike. You were hidden. I couldn't see you. My, Mike Lovecheck is our engineering manager for um, the canyon. I apologize. Sorry. See, I told them I would screw up first so they don't have to worry about it. So, and that was a leftover purpose, so we're going to ignore that. This is basically another one of your work plan topics, and this is we're needing a recommendation on what you think is the best approach for um, our spent nuclear fuel and our H Canyon operations. And we're going to get into what those options can be. We already introduced the panel members, so you would have been on the slide. So, so why operate H Canyon? And I, so there is a law that is out there. It's um, Title 50 USC Code 2633, um, which requires us to operate H Canyon, and that is actually what the law says right there in the screen. Secretary of Energy um, shall continue operations and maintain a high state of readiness at the H Canyon facility um, at the Savannah River site in Aiken, South Carolina, and shall provide technical staff necessary to operate and so maintain such facility. You've heard the law probably shrink. Um, some people don't think it says H Canyon, things like that. This is the actual law and what it says. So you have that going forward now. Um, the other benefits to processing and operating H Canyon, it actually takes the fuel, which is, you know, you've seen the fuel elements and you'll get to see some more now, and puts it in a more stable form. We're able to remove that uranium, we can reuse that uranium, and then we can put all of the fission products and the bad items into a much more stable form, whether it be the glass or the salt stone that uh, the high level waste program does for us. So that's the other benefit and why we operate H Canyon. This is our state map. Some of our um, cab members have seen this. Um, you can see in the background is the state of South Carolina. We like to show what's coming in and what's going out. So I'll try to use the pointer. So you see this is domestic research reactor fuel that comes in from like MIT and MER. A lot of our research reactors in the United States comes into L area. We also have material that comes from the NNSA program, which is for non-proliferation um, activities from around the world. So when we went to the Atoms for Peace program, the United States loaned out uranium to a lot of the countries so they could do their research to prevent it being done on weapons and just to be for benefit to humans. So as part of that, we do repatriate that material back to the United States. And that's what you see coming here into El Basin. Um, there is some plutonium that goes into K area from that program, but we're going to focus on H and L today. So what happens is we store that material wet 
in a basin and L basin, and Keela's gonna go through that whole process for you. We send it over to H Canyon where it gets processed, and Rick's gonna go through that process for you. And then any of the waste products will come out and go over to the high level waste program, either through salt processing or DWPF, and eventually will end up into a glass form that can go to a federal repository. Um, the do, we do get a product out of this, which is the uranium, and we can actually send that currently as low enriched uranium, which means it's less than 20%. What we send to TVA is actually at 4.95% uranium. And they actually will take that, turn it into a fuel, and they'll use it for operations of commercial electrical production. So it goes in the TVA reactors. I think it's Browns Ferry. That is, Browns Ferry is where they make the electricity. And in the past, we've sent enough of that material that we could power um, every house in South Carolina for 10 years. So it's a lot of material that you can get a benefit out of. The other option that you see up here is probably new to a lot of um, CAB members. It's called HALU, or high assay LEU. There's a lot of research reactors that need LEU fuel, low enriched uranium fuel, at a higher level, which is like 19.95% uranium enriched. That's a potential. That's why you see it's a dashed line. It's a potential that we could do. It's a simple change to our process. We just don't dilute the material down as much, and then we can produce that material as well. We do not have authority to do that at this point, though. That's just something we're capable of doing. Okay? Whoops. So this is a new chart. Um, we tried to tr put something together that would show all of the interactions of what goes on with our nuclear materials program. So you see at the heart, wrong thing, sorry. Okay. The heart is L Basin and H Canyon. So this is the domestic research reactor, Office of Science, Office of Nuclear Energy, and Office or Department of Commerce all send material to us through the DRR program to L Basin. So if we stop up L Basin, we affect all of those programs. And then the FRR program, the foreign fuel receipts, is what NNSA does. We impact those receipts coming back to the United States. If you stop H Canyon, you stop L Basin, you impact everybody. Um, you'll see TRM, that's our target residue material. This is a liquid waste stream that comes in from Canada um, and it goes straight to the canyon because it's already in a dissolved form so it can be processed through there. But it's still part of the FRR program. FCA is new, that's called Fast Critical Assembly. That's actually a fuel from Japan that uh, NNSA has sent back. It's in a different type of um, plate so it's not really stored in L Basin, it's stored dry in drums, but it will be processed through H Canyon through a different dissolver that NNSA and the Japanese will be paying to install in H Canyon, and that's an electrolytic dissolver. That's a new program that we just got information on this year to go forward with that, so we'll be working that in the future. And then again, our byproducts are the the waste goes to a high-level waste system, and then we produce the uranium for the LEU, to a fuel fabricator, to TVA. So you can see there's a lot involved with everything that we do. Um, so we're going to get into this a lot, <laughs> but this is what we call our placemat. You saw one for 235F. This is the one for H Canyon, um, and it's, there's a lot of questions of what do you run through the canyon? How long do you run through the canyon? How fast do you run that material through the canyon? And that's what this placemat is trying to get at. So there's, there's decision points. Hold on, as I mess up again. So right now, we're currently approved to run material through uh, the AROD campaign, or the amended record of decision, which originally was anticipated to be done in 2024. Um, our budget levels will determine when that actually gets done, depending on what our levels are. Um, so, but that's the 1,000 bundles and the 200 hyper cores, which is enough to allow L Basin to not fill up and be able to receive those future projected receipts that we're going to be getting so that we don't have to install new storage racks. Um, there's options that we're going to get into of is dry storage an option for aluminum clad fuel? Bill's gonna go into those details, but these other scenarios are just levels of how much do you know about dry storage? 
How much do you do with tank farms? Because you, we're intimately involved with the tank farms. They're gonna stop our seats in 2030 time period. That's why you see that date up there. Or, and then 2040 is currently what we project if we were to do all of the fuel in L Basin that can go through the canyon, that's aluminum clad, and if we did an exchange with some of the fuel at Idaho, that is aluminum clad as well. So those are the different options, and we're gonna be giving you information on all of those type of things. Okay? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Keela. Good afternoon, my name is Keela Lofton. I'm the L Area Facility Manager. Hold on, she's gotta get you up there. Okay. Oh, we were supposed to take questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> James is giving me the eye. Well, I just, <laughs> we can do things out of order, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. So if you do want to do a couple of very targeted questions, Dave. Dave Isley, Cab. Who is the customer for HALU? So that would be the research reactors, and so there is some NNSA programs that also need it as well. So this is the, a way to get away from using the really high and rich stuff, get less than 20 percent? Yes. Okay, got it. Thanks. It, right. Maxine, just to add to mm -hmm. that, it also could be some of the advanced reactors that True. The Office of Nuclear Energy is doing some funding in the commercial sector as well, so not just research. Right. Charles. Charles Hilton, CAP. Maxine, you mentioned that you could process potentially FCA material from Japan, and you mentioned electrolytic process. All right, we've talked a lot about stainless steel fuel rods stored in AL to exchange them get out of here because Idaho is the only people that can process those now. Would this give us the capability of processing the stainless steel in L Basin? It definitely would give us the capability. There'd be more research that we would have to do for getting the flow sheets ready and prepared for that, but it would give us more capability, yes. Okay, and Joyce. I I'm sorry, I, I would add one more thing to that. Uh, we have had the capabilities of the electrolytic dissolver in the past. We lasted that in the late 70s, early 80s. So it's not something that's foreign to us altogether, but we have not had that capability since then. And so this would just be reestablishing that capability. Is that because of funding issues? No, it was more because of the mission need. There was no need for that, that dissolver and that uh, operation since then. Okay. And now Joyce. Joyce Underwood Cab, was it legislated just to ensure the completion of the EM mission? So the, I believe, now this is before my time, but I believe the law was put in place when they went and closed F Canyon so that the United States would have that capability um, of processing nuclear materials because at a production scale. If we lose H Canyon, the United States does not have a production scale processing of nuclear materials capability anymore. They all will have been shut down if we lose H Canyon. So, so not I, just for the cleanup, but for other things as well. Exactly. Okay, and that's a federal law, right? It is a federal okay. law. Thank you. All right. Keela. Now Keela, sorry. <laughs> all right, again, my name is Keela Lofton. I'm the L Area Facility Manager. Okay, we'll get started with an aerial view of L area and to use the pointer, the 105 basin um, is right there, that concrete structure, and that housed the reactor and the current L area basin. So you'll hear the term spent fuel project and L area interchangeably. So the spent fuel project is housed in L area. Just to give you a little bit of history about L area, we started reactor operations in 1954. It was started as a production reactor for radioactive isotopes. Uh, it was shut down in 1968, restarted again in 1985. At that time, the Phoenix became the symbol and it was shut down again in 1988 and at the bottom. 
It's just some dimensions of the 105 facility. Okay, we have two current primary missions in L area. One is the non-proliferation mission in which we receive aluminum-based spent um, nuclear fuel from the domestic research reactor and the foreign research reactor <coughs> program that fuel is stored in the L area basin. The fuel from the DRR program comes from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and a couple of um, universities and the FRR program that fuel comes in from around the world. Originally started out with Sweden. We received uh, fuel from Switzerland, Jamaica, Argentina. Currently we have fuel from Portugal and, and Greece um, that we're processing. And we also send spent nuclear fuel to H Canyon. So that's our second mission and we send um, the hyper fuel and MTR fuel to H Canyon for dissolution. If you look at the pictures at the bottom, this is a picture of a cast coming from Oak Ridge National Laboratory and to the left of that, I'm sorry, to the left of that is fuel being sent to H Canyon. It's sent to H Canyon by rail. Okay, just to talk a little bit about the L area fuel basin. It contains 3.4 million uh, gallons of water. The depth ranges from 17 feet to 50 feet. Primarily, we have expanded basin storage racks along with hyper racks. In the picture, you see two gentlemen above the EBS racks and they're loading a fuel bundle into the racks. What's great about our basin in terms of safety, there's no active um, cooling required. Our racks actually serve as a fixed geometry for criticality control and our racks are seismically qualified. So there's a lot of safety built into the configuration in L Basin. The table is a uh, picture of uh, a chart of our inventory that we have. We do get some fuel into unique geometries and so that fuel is stored in the oversized can racks and also um, in the bucket storage. But as I mentioned before, our two primary ways of storing spent nuclear fuel is with the EBS racks and our hypercores, and you can see that from the capacity there. Also, if you look at the percent field, that's pretty high with 89% for the EBS and 85% uh, for the hypercores, um, and we plan um, to bring that number down as we ship to H Canyon. And you'll see that in some of the profile charts as I get a little bit further into the presentation. For the fuel assemblies, what I'm pointing to is the MTR fuel assemblies. And we put about three to four of those into an actual bundle. And right next to that is a picture of our fuel bundle. What's great about the fuel bundle is that it's aluminum. So when it's shipped to H Canyon, they can dissolve that bundle um, in the dissolver in H Canyon. So you don't have to do any unpacking when it gets there. To the bottom left is a hypercore. That's actually two pieces. They are inner and outer. To the right of it, you can see what it looks like in the L basin. So the inner core is stored to the right on the slimmer stand, and the outer core is stored on uh, the thicker stand. Okay, and to talk a little bit about our uh, FRR program. Right now, the NEPA is authorized to 2019. We are in the process of uh, extending that out for another 10 years to 2029 for Japan. As you all remember what happened with Fukushima, so there were some delays there with Japan shipping to us. 
So you can see the number of bundles and cash that we uh, expect to receive from Japan and those shipments will start in 2021. For the DRR program that HEPA, uh, yeah, that NEPA is authorized through 2035. And you can see the bundles that we expect to receive and hypercores and, and the cask. Um, to the right of that is a BRR cast that's used for the DRR program. So University of Missouri and MIT use that cask. And you can see from the inside of it is what it looks like with the fuel stored. Okay, right now we are in the midst of a campaign to send um, 1,000 MTR bundles to H Canyon along with up to 200 hyper cores to H Canyon. And that is targeted to be complete 2024. Um, so during that campaign, we expect to dissolve 3.3 metric tons of heavy metal aluminum, highly enriched uranium. Um, the good thing about that um, is that's actually, as Maxine mentioned, is going to make room for the upcoming receipts that we're planning. And also, it allows us to be able to blend down the HEU to LAU that's used in the commercial power reactors. And you can see what we've done thus far. We've entered into the campaign approximately 25, I'm sorry, 250 process of the MTR bundles and 25 of the hyper cores. Okay, this is a chart to show where we are as far as processing um, our hyper cores, our receipts from Oak Ridge National Laboratory and our shipments to Age Canyon. So the green is actually our shipments out and our line bar that is actually the receipts coming in. And the uh, dash bar, that's our inventory. So we do have to keep track of what we have coming into the basin versus what we're sending out to Age Canyon just to make sure that we have sufficient inventory. And you can see from 2019 to 2024, based on that um, 200 hypercore campaign where we'll end up in 2024, when that campaign ends, our inventory will be back close to zero, where we'll make room for our future receipts. And you can show that, see there that we have receipts planned out to 2034. And at that time, we'll be back up to our capacity, 120. And the next slide shows what we anticipate as the 2020 funding impacts. So a couple of things to point out here. <coughs> So the 2020 funding impacts for HYPER, if you take a look at uh, FY 2020, the number of cores uh, shipped to H Canyon is five. If you look, refer back to the previous slide, we actually plan to send 24 cores to H Canyon. So that's a decrease and that five cores represents processing a single batch in 2020. The other impact, if you look at the, if you look at the chart, is that the campaign has moved a year out to complete 
um, in 2025 versus 2024. If you look back at uh, FY 2034 at the end of the NEPA, uh, you can see that that has not changed, that we will end there with a capacity of uh, being filled completely with uh, 120 hypercores being stored in the basin. Okay, now for the MTR fuel, looking at um, what we see as far as our forecast for our receipts and our shipments. Again, we're in the campaign to send a thousand MTR bundles, <coughs> excuse me, to H Canyon. You can see that we're getting ready to ramp up 2021 out to uh, 2024 in that and you can see the capacity is actually coming down through in those latter years as far as inventory um, in the basin and if you look out starting 2025 when that campaign ends we'll still have receipts coming into l area but we don't get close to the capacity the capacity is there at the top the uh, 3,650. So by the time we end um, at 2035, the end of the authorization for NEPA, we'll have about 750 spaces still available in the L Basin. So as Maxine identified, you would not need to install racks. Okay, taking a look at the 2020 impacts for the MTR fuel bundles. Um, and if you know, if you look at FY 2020, there are no shipments shown for uh, H Canyon. So we'll continue to receive, but in 2020, there are no shipments for H Canyon. And that actually, again, pushes the campaign to complete out a year later in 2025. And there, overall, there is no impact to uh, 2035, in which you'll see that we still have capacity there in the L area basin. So in summary, in L area with the spent fuel project, we are positioned to continue to support the non-proliferation mission, continuing to receive the receipts from the DRR and the FRR programs, and also positioned to continue to make uh, spent nuclear fuel shipments to H Canyon. Okay. Next slide. Yes. All, right. All right. So any questions specific to this one? Let's start with Doug. Uh, Doug Howard Cab, um, thank you for that wonderful brief presentation. Question I have is, um, you received funding from the um, foreign countries that um, bring send their their uh, their fuel into you. So. Yes, if they're a high income country, we do have um, fuel fees that we get from them. It's a, um, an offset, it's not a full cost recovery. So we do get those fees and those fees are um, set, set aside to handle infrastructure for L area. Okay, can you tell us what the, the breakdown as far as percentages that you get from them and other customers versus what you get from uh, uh, Department of Energy? Um, I can put it in a range. I don't really have the percentages between. It's very small. We may get um, four million dollars a year from the foreign countries, and we get about forty million dollars from um, our EM budget for L area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Joyce. Joyce Underwood Cab, I would like to preface my question with an apology. I am not trying to open up a can of worms, but I want some clarification. On slide seven about the foreign research reactor fuel, is that the same thing as the German spent nuclear fuel that we've talked about? So no, it's not. The German fuel um, is a graphite fuel and it's in a sphere form. It's stored dry in cast iron ca um, cask. 
Um, so that project is very different than what LRA does. Okay, thank you. Dave Isley, Cap, thank you for that. Um, uh, one of the slides says the, uh, the extension to the Japanese past uh, May of 19, is that the only extension or projected extension? So um, it's not just for the Japanese, but that's the main one. There will be some others like Finland and Canada will have an extension. They'll be part of that extension as well. Um, but it basically has to have secretarial approval to be included in the extension. So. I guess the real question is in two months, FR is done except for the extensions. Is there any other outliers out there that might say, hey, how about us? So that's the NNSA program, and they do have countries that have material that they would like to get back, but they're not willing to send it back at this time. So in the future, there may be some of those that are, exist, but right now we don't know of them. Thank you. Right. Dave Avakis. Uh, Dave Avakis, CAB. The uh, fuel uh, reactors from Japan, are they stored at the site after they're processed? Wait, are the FCA material, is that what you're asking about, or? The uh, FRR. The FRR, so it would be handled like any other fuel. It, so it would go through our high-level waste tanks, it would go um, into the glass logs the same way. And, and they remain at the, uh, at the site? Yes. Int until a federal repository is available for the glass logs, yes. All right. Sorry. Gil? Thanks. Uh, Maxine, you mentioned Adams for Peace, and I mean, it's not, I mean, for some of us, this board has, um, in the past, has questioned the legi legitimacy of uh, some of the spent nuclear fuel being uh, used for non-proliferation purposes elsewhere. Um, does DOE make that judgment of whether the U.S. origin spent nuclear fuel is a is acceptable to be returned to us, or is that a decision made by another body? Uh, it's a decision made by NNSA that we aren't involved with. Okay. On the EM side. Okay. So, it, so NNSA makes the decision that's out of our purview, and they say yes, we're accepting it back. Um, without H Canyon, um, where would, how would the U.S. handle this stuff, or how would we handle it without H Canyon? Um, it would probably have to go into some kind of storage facility uh, until another processing capability were, were determined or a final disposition, dry storage, or some other path was available, like through the federal repository. So just to be clear, and I know we're probably going to say this a few times today, without H Canyon, we come to a grinding halt as far as processing it. As far as processing, yes, sir, currently. Thank you. Dave, did you have another question? Okay. Any more questions from around the table? Oh, Mr. Smith. Bob Smith, Cab. Based on those graphs, does that imply then that after 2025 we become a storage facility alone? So um, we do not have any NEPA documentation or any decisions that tell us to go past that right now. So that's the only thing that we can assume in our graphs for capacity. So it doesn't mean we have to be a storage facility only. It's just what we are authorized for right now. Thank you. Joyce, you found more questions? Joyce Underwood Cab. This just popped into my head. So does EM kind of share this facility with NNSA, sort of? No, EM owns the facility. EM owns the facility. When the EM mission is completed, because the law says it's got to keep going, will NNSA take over ownership of it? I, you don't I, I can't that. answer that. I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, it, there's all kinds of decisions that are being ideas kicked around of who does what with what facilities out there right now and in the future, but none of that's been decided at this point. So there's just no idea what happens when the EM mission is complete with that. It's just... Correct. So for ether. L Basin, with EM owning the facility, we would be going through, similar to what you heard about 235F, we'd be going through and deactivating that facility and getting it into a point where it could be decommissioned by our um, area completion folks. Well, would that mean you'd have to rewrite that law? Yes. Okay. 
But that, that law is specific to H Canyon, not L Basin, though. Okay. All right. Any other questions from around the table? Bob? Going back to my original question, then, Assuming that after 2025 we become a storage facility, is the DOE putting together a plan to request additional funding and or programs to continue the uh, handling of the materials beyond 25? So after 2025, we have to have a disposition path for it. So whether it stays in wet storage, goes to dry storage, or gets processed, um, we have to have some kind of disposition path. It can't just stay in the basin currently from what we know and be closed in the basin. It has to have a disposition path somewhere else right now. Okay. So yeah. what's the plan? So that's what we want to talk to you about and we, we can get to that at the end of all the presentations. Okay. All right. Gil. Gil, you mentioned Oak Ridge in one of your slides. Yes, um, sir. What other sites does L Basin receive um, material from? Uh, we receive it um, from some of the universities, um, so as you, I mentioned, so University of Missouri, um, MIT, okay. um, and um, from the DRR program, I'm just trying to yes. think, those are, I guess, are, yeah, from this, yeah, so that those are primary ones right now for DRR. Uh, for FRR, we do receive uh, spent nuclear fuel from more sources. I mean, so other sources like other EM sites? Uh, no, um, there are civilian sites. Civilian sites? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions from around the table? All right. Mr. Burns. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Burns, and I manage the uh, H Canyon facility. Okay, I did it right the first time. So H Canyon has been a workhorse for Savannah River site uh, since 1955. Um, we've never had uh, an uncontrolled criticality accident. In fact, uh, we really have had a stellar safety record uh, for those now almost 65 years of operation. Uh, what do we do? We recover highly enriched uranium. Uh, from, as, as Keela said, the foreign research reactors, domestic research reactors, and then there was some other uh, sources of material that have come to Savannah River site, and we've processed that material. Um, when they built the facility in 1955, you know, quite honestly, I'm amazed at the, the flexibility they built into our plant to enable us to process multiple materials. So initially, we processed the PU-239 to support the weapons program, and then we quickly realized we we're going to have to start recycling the uranium-235 to support the weapons program. Uh, so that became the primary mission for H Canyon. But then there was a whole host of other uh, isotopes for some of the research that was being doing, done in our country. And uh, Savannah River site was asked to participate in that. And H Canyon, uh, working with the scientists at SRNL, uh, developed flow paths to uh, process those various materials. Um, so our primary objective today is to, to stabilize SRS and other DOE-wide complex legacy materials. We have played a significant re role in uh, reducing the footprint at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California, Los Alamos National Lab out in New Mexico, uh, the Hanford site in the state of Washington, as well as Y-12 up in Tennessee. Um, currently, in the, in the mid-2000s, I think we, we talked on this early, earlier, um, we, we took the enriched uranium, we blended it with the natural uranium, and re re recycled that material, and it was processed in commercial reactors in Tennessee. Uh, we're working right now, the material we're processing, we're storing that, and we're going to reinitiate that program in the next, next couple years, and we'll recycle that uh, HEU material, blend it down, and uh, again, make commercial fuel. At least that's the plan today. And we, we, along the, the years, we've also, we continue to support the nonproliferation programs here in our country. You know, I consider uh, H Canyon a national treasure, and there's a couple reasons for that, but as I said, we've had proven performance over the, uh, over 55 years. Actually, as I said, we're approaching 65 years now. We are the only operational U.S large-scale facility for processing uh, radiochemicals, uh, basically various SNM materials, uh, 
and dispositioning those surplus materials and then putting them in a safe, stable form by transferring them either to uh, uh, DWPF or, or the saltstone facility and then recovering uh, the, the HEU from those materials we process. Uh, we do have demonstrated technology with uh, flexible capabilities. You know, working with our scientists, as I said, we can change our flow paths and there's a lot of things the canyon is capable of doing. Um, we do have a proven and qualified workforce today, and we can safely operate the plant. But one of the things I will say about people, um, my manager often asks the question, what keeps you awake at night? And the one thing I will tell him is, is the people. It's the team that we have in place today. And, and what keeps me awake, you know, when you really look at Savannah River site, in the early 1950s, we hired several people. Most of the operators and technicians came right here from the South Carolina, Georgia area, and they were trained. And then they operated the site because this was really one of the best facilities to work in anywhere around here, pay-wise, benefit-wise. And they stayed here, the majority of the vast majority stayed until into the 1980s. So in the 1979, 1980 time frame, the plant realized that there's going to be a high rate of attrition because those people were all approaching retirement. So we started a, an intense hiring wave ahead of those retirements. So we had an opportun opportunity for that smooth transition to bring new people on board. Um, I know s sitting here at this table, Jimmy Winkler and I were two of those people. I'm not sure if we were the best people, but we were brought in in the, in the early 1980s. And then um, now today, that wave in the 1980s has already started that attrition process and are retiring. Uh, because of limited funding over the past few years, I have been able to hire, as someone retires, once they retire, I've been authorized to bring someone else on board. And that makes it very difficult when you're operating a plant because now there's a gap because it takes me a while to get that new operator up to speed. And we're trying to get ahead of that, but it, that, that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night is trying to bring those new people on board after people have retired and then transitioning that knowledge. So that's one of the challenges we have. But, but I will say I have an adequate force today to operate the plant. Now, uh, the other thing is, uh, fortunately in my career, or maybe unfortunately for some of my managers, I have cycled back and forth through H Canyon, uh, H area in the separation facilities a few times in my career. So early in my career when we operated the plant, I probably had about 25, 30 percent more operators and technicians running. So I could operate the plant in parallel. So I could be running what I call the hot canyon operations and the warm canyon operations in parallel. Well, today with the staffing I have to safely operate the plant, I'll run the hot side for a while, process that waste, and then run the warm side. So I'm running in series. So it does decrease my throughput. Talking a little bit about our structure, we do have, you know, we're going to show some pictures of the canyon. It's a very robust facility. Uh, we meet the current safety requirements uh, for the department. And um, we have some very good engineered features. Like I said, the flexibility that was built into the plant early on in the design has uh, worked well for us over the years. Um, we have all the support systems required to operate the plant. But again, what I will tell you is we're running a plant that is 65 years old. Uh, the budget is limited, uh, so every day, you know, I have to look at and, you know, we look at and say, so first thing I fund is maintaining my safety systems. Then I pay my employees, and then I, whatever operating costs I need to do. To give you an example, um, I was working in the canyons in the late 1980s, and we put in a new hot... So this just shows some key dates, and, and I'm not going to go through every date and talk about every mission that's up there. I know you guys ate lunch and you probably want to get out here a little early today. So, but I will, I will pick, point out a couple things. So early on, like I said, we processed PU-239 to support weapons. Uh, in the early 60s, the need was identified for PU-238 to support the, the space program. So that was H Canyon and HB Line that processed all that PU-238 that went over uh, to Jeff Hastie's facility, uh, 235F. That's where it came from. Uh, we processed that, that material in H area. Uh, in the 2003 time frame, we took a lot of the HEU yet that we had accumulated over the years, and that's when we started the, the HEU blend down program. A couple other things I'll point out, though, that the facility has supported throughout the years that aren't even listed up here. Um, uh, we've been used as a test facility platform for, for various research projects, uh, some of them uh, classified projects, uh, but there's a need uh, in our country for some of those projects. Um, 
When we were generating waste during the Cold War, a lot of that material doesn't meet the stringent uh, packaging requirements for day today's waste. Uh, so for several years there, we reprocessed, we used this facility to repackage all that waste so it would meet today's requirements. And so that was done in H Canyon. And the other thing, I, I call it the cats and dogs. You know, I remember one Christmas, I got a call from Hanford. And again, I go back to the PU-238. You know, Hanford also did some research with some PU-238. And when they got done with it, they didn't know what to do with it. You know, PU-238 is a very difficult isotope to work with. So I have a lot of respect for what Jeff Hasty and his team are doing right now. Uh, and so they put it in drums and stored it. They buried it. And again, the Defense Board identified that issue and they said, hey, what are you going to do with those drums of PU-238? Find something to do with them. Well, guess where it came from? It came to. It came to H Canyon. You know, we have the capability when the, when the complex identifies those cats and dogs, we have the facilities and the structures to handle those kind of materials. This, ju this just shows the original cycle. You know, the material would go to our reactors here at Savannah River site. It would come to H Canyon. We'd recover the HEU. We'd actually send the HEU uh, in liquid form back up to Tennessee. Uh, they would put it back in the metal. It would come to us, and then we'd recycle it back in the reactor. So from about 1960 to 1988, that was the primary mission for H Canyon. So he this is a picture of H Canyon. It's about three football fields long. Uh, some of those walls are about six foot thick, and uh, there's a significant concrete pad underneath the canyon building. It, it's it's going to be difficult to see, but there's a railroad spur on this end of the canyon, so the material that Keel sends me comes over, and it comes into the south end of the building. And if I want to bring new equipment into the warm side, there's actually a truck well here, and I can back a truck in and get materials into the canyon. I also use that uh, truck well for another activity I'll discuss in a minute. If I was able to take a knife and slice the canyon down the middle looking north to south, whoops, there I knew I'd do it, I knew I'd do it one time. So why do we call it a canyon? So I told you it was about, it's over a thousand feet long. And when it was first built, they came in and dug this big trench. One story is below ground. So a lot of the farmers that we hired to build this plant looked at it and said, man, that looks like a giant canyon. Well, that has stuck ever since the early 1950s when they called that building a canyon. Um, so there's ground level. So most of the vessels in the canyons are below ground. So hot side, warm side. Why do we call one side the hot side? So the fuel that came in from the reactors had a lot of fission products, so radioactively it was very hot. So we called it the hot canyon. We're pretty simple people. Um, now, once it goes through the initial processing and we get rid of the majority of the fission products, I transfer it over to the other side because now it doesn't have as many fission products and we call it the warm canyon. So that's basically where that uh, terminology came from. My folks, they work in the middle of the building. Down on the bottom, I have a lot of support equipment. Second level is where all the interface goes uh, to the canyon. That's where I transfer my chemicals in, uh, instrumentation. And third level, I have the chemical tanks that I use to support the process. And then on fourth level, I have my control rooms and some offices. And, and in fact, that's where my office is, up on fourth level. Unfortunately, because we're right there in the center, we, we have no windows. That's what a canyon looks like. So when it was designed, it was designed with cells. You can see there's numbers down the wall. It has, the canyon has 18 sections. It was built in sections. From sections five through 18, there's various vessels. And okay, well, I'm not quite good yet. Where was I? Why does it do that? Okay. Okay. So that basically is a picture of the canyon. It's very flexible. So I can change out the tanks remotely with our cranes. You know, the hot canyon, once we went operational, no one's been out in the hot canyon. Uh, at the south end of the warm canyon, we, do, we can send people in there, uh, but right around section five. 
And, uh, but, but all activities, changing out all the tanks, change it, changing out all the piping uh, can be done remotely. And the other thing is, if you look to the left of that screen, there's a series of long transfer routes. And we can change those transfer routes. So we really have the capability to transfer from any tank in the canyon to any other tank in the canyon uh, based on if a need is identified. This just shows a close-up of a cell showing the tanks. The other thing we have, which is a unique compared to a lot of the other uh, processing facilities in the DOE complex, is all my affluent air from the canyon goes through a sand filter. And that gives me a lot of benefit, especially in safety basis space. Because, you know, if you have what, what we call design-based fire in a facility, if you have like uh, a heap of filtration type system, you know, a lot of the materials that come off from a, the combustion of, of, of various materials in your facility can plug those filters pretty quickly. Okay, this facility, this sand filter is a, a very long, long structure and uh, it will not be plugged. So it always ensures that I have good ventilation uh, coming out of my canyon and that's very important for the operation of any nuclear facility. I had to throw this picture in. So, you know, one of the things we do, there's a lot of things we do to verify the integrity of our plant. And uh, you've probably heard discussions, you may have seen articles in the newspaper uh, talking about uh, maintaining the structure, especially of our, we have a canyon exhaust duct, duct that runs from the canyon out to the sand filter structure and then eventually that air will go through some fans and out our stack. And we check that integrity pretty often. So today as we're sitting here talking, I have a team of workers right now and they have a robotic crawler down there in that tunnel. Every two years we go in and do an inspection and that inspection is going on as you and I are speaking right now. And then they're just looking at the walls, making sure that it's gonna meet the structural requirements that I have to have to continue to run my plant. I'm gonna talk briefly about the canyon operation. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. Uh, if you guys have any, uh, any more detailed questions later, in fact, I'll let Mike uh, Lovecheck, my engineer man, answer those, because he's, he's well-versed in our process. Um, but anyway, so, as Keila said, we receive material um, from L area. So I receive two fuels right now from L area. I re receive the material test reactor fuels, and it comes over in a bundle. It's an, it's an aluminum bundle. It looks just like this, except it's much taller, about 13 feet in length. And so she had a picture of a series of different uh, M, uh, material test reactor fuels. Uh, they're usually three to four feet in length. And, and L area in their basin, they'll stack those in here. They close this up, and then when my engineering team, they'll develop a charge plan, and these bundles come to us, and we use our crane to take them out of that rail car and put them into the dissolver, and we dissolve them, and then we recover the material. The other thing she's already talked about, um, the hyper fuel, it comes over, it's a different container. It looks like a bucket uh, with a big loop on the top so our cranes can handle it, uh, and there's a, a big bucket and a little bucket. And that hyper fuel comes over, and then we also process that material. I have two dissolvers. I process the hyper fuel in one dissolver, and I'll process the MTR fuel in the other. And the reason being is the insert for introducing the fuel is different based on the type of fuel. So right now, those are the two fuels, of, of, uh, fuel, two fuels that I'm currently dissolving. I have a third stream, which is relatively new to the plant. Uh, we are receiving some material from Canada. We call it the target residue material, and that comes to me in liquid form. So we process that. We transfer that into a tank downstream of the dissolution process. And I'll talk a little, a little more detail in a second. That's a picture of a cast car, and it shows the hyper fuel. Just another cutaway section of the hyper fuel. It's basically in curved sheets. Uh, this is pretty good stuff. It's pretty high in, the, in uranium. And so it's uh, beneficial for us to process this material and recover that uranium. Again, the picture of the MTR fuel. Okay, I'll talk just briefly about the Canadian fuel. So there's a couple good things I like about the Canadian fuel. One is we came up working with SRNL and my operations team. We developed the methodology and the equipment that would be required to receive liquid fuel from off-site here at Savannah River site, and then eventually process that material. Uh, the other benefit was because the operations team worked so closely with SRNL, 
Uh, it became very efficient and it, it, it what I call operator friendly. When you're operating a plant, that's really important to me to make sure that uh, when I put something new in, it's something that uh, the team can operate. Uh, the thing I like the most, this did come with funding. Uh, can, can, yeah, I like that. Uh, Canada provided us the funding for all the initial equipment uh, that we installed, and we do get quarterly payments for, from Canada. And I will say that we have stayed on schedule, and when Canada can ship, we can process and we've stayed with them this entire campaign so far. And I have about another 12 months, somewhere in about the 12, 12 months worth of receiving material from Canada. Uh, this just shows a picture of the, uh, well, no, it doesn't. It comes in in like a sea land container. This is equipment like you just see at a dock down in Charleston, South Carolina. We unload the sea land container. And then inside, there's a very formidable, formidable shipping container, and inside are four canisters that contain the liquid fuel. And that just, that's another picture of, and then all the, the material, all the equipment for unloading this. Let me get. This basically has a robotic arm that can reach into that shipping container, and it slowly pulls out uh, each canister one by one, and it puts it into a heavy shielded, uh, what we call a pig or a cask, and then we can process it. This material is radio radiologically very hot. This was material, this was dissolved uranium that came right out, of the de right out of the reactors up in Canada. And so we still have to process it through the canyon to get rid of those fission products. And so uh, we, we design systems to protect our, our workers, and, and the dose we receive is very, very low. I, in fact, I've been very impressed with the uh, uh, the way this, this equipment was set up and how we've been able to protect our workers. And this goes back to once we start LEU blend down and I get the material, uh, we, we put it in these cans, they're called LR230s, it's about 230 gallons of low enriched uranium fuel and we'll process it. I'm going to step back one, just a few slides, because now you've seen what I received. So I dissolve the material. When I dissolve that, I'm dissolving everything. I'm dissolving all the aluminum as well as the HEU material. And so we usually get some particulate in there, typically silica. And so the next stage of the process, we call it head end. We, we, we make a big tank of jello. And uh, we, we add the solution to the jello. And then as we cool down the jello, um, the jello basically solidifies around the particulate. And then I send that to a centrifuge, and the solids get slung out to the sides of the centrifuge, literally. I, the product overflows. I rinse those gelatin cakes to get as much product out as I can. I dispose of the gelatin as waste, and now I have what we call a clarified solution. The next stage in the process is we call it cycle operations. Cycle operations is, you know, if you really think back when you go to like an Italian restaurant and have you an oil and vinegar mixture, um, there's a process, we call it solvent extraction, and we know if we control the chemistry, we can take that dissolved uranium solution, it's in nitric acid, so it's called urinal nitrate, and when it comes, if, if I control the acidity and I control the temperature, I can make the enriched uranium that I want to collect go from that acid stream or aqueous stream into the solvent. And that leaves behind the fission products I didn't want. So then I can process that out as waste. And then when I adjust the chemistry again, I can make the uranium go back from the solvent back into the aqueous stream. And that's essentially what we're doing in solvent extraction. We're separating out, we're extracting out the material we want to keep, get rid of our fission products, and then bringing it back and putting it back in the acid stream for further processing. Once it comes out of first cycle operation, I will send it to second. We call it second uranium cycle operation. Same process, it's just that this time there's just, uh, just a little bit of impurities in there, and I, I just have to get, get it purified to meet reactor specifications because they're so tight. And so that's what we do in second uranium cycle. And right now I'm store, storing that material, and as I said, eventually I'll go into my LEU blend down program again.
that's a picture of my new warm crane that I put in 30 years ago. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for us? Doug, we'll start with you. Uh, Doug Howard Cap, great presentation. Sir, um, you said that safety, you have not had an accident since? We have, um, never had a, we have never had a criticality accident. Criticality, okay. But what, why do you think that is? I mean, what is, what stands out the most that keeps you at what you're at right now? Well, I think there, there's, there's a handful of things. I think uh, uh, the culture that was developed early on in the site is carried through where safety is a priority at the site. It's a safety culture. Uh, we operate by procedure. And over the years, you know, in, in, the, in, in the nuclear industry in total, uh, we evaluate every accident. And I think every site does that. And you look hard and say, hey, could that happen to you? And what controls do you put in place to prevent that? And so I think as an industry, uh, we have matured over the years. And we continue to put additional layers of safety into, into our procedures, into our safety basis documents to prevent that from ever happening. Are you staffed at 100% uh, of personnel right now? Or? I am not staffed at 100% uh, for processing the way I would like to process. I am staffed at 100% to safely operate the plant. Uh, I maintain everything within my safety basis envelope. You know, we identify what we call min staffing, and yes, I meet min staffing requirements, and, and I'm a little bit above min staffing, which enables me to process at the rates I'm currently processing. And what is your attrition rate right now? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can probably help with that. In the last uh, three years, our overall attrition rate in our uh, organization has been about 10 to 12 percent per year. So of the 400 operators, uh, we've lost 40 to 50 per year for the last three years. And the last question, are your personnel cross-trained? I mean, does every, is everybody trained to do all the jobs on your particular site? The, the short answer is no. You know, we are working towards a getting additional cross training, and that's really one of you know, and that's one of the things we talk about. So, when I have a 35-year experienced man go out the door, who has four or five cross, he's cross trained in four or five areas, and I bring that new person in, and it takes me 12 months to get him his first qualification. That's really what the other thing that really impacts our operation. But you know, we have a plan. We're cross training people every day. Uh, we set training plans for each individual saying here's where we want you to go to But as you bring these new people on board, it just takes time It takes time in the seat to get them ready and really to assume responsibility Thanks for what you do right. Joyce Joyce Underwood cab I Have two questions the first one is on slide seven Okay, on that picture behind you. You said that you've moved stuff from the hot side to the warm side. It's not on this picture. How do you get it from one side to the other? There, there are, there's piping, we call there's it crossovers. Pipe. That, there are crossover piping that can go from one side to the other. We have embedded piping in the canyon that's embedded in that concrete that was put oh, in okay. when we designed the facility. Even because even the, the chemicals that there's there's pass throughs that were designed into the plant uh, so you can safely uh, transfer materials w without breaching containment of the canyon itself. Good so question, it's though. There, Thank you. I just can't see it on that picture. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't show that level of detail. Yeah, if, if you look at the, uh, the cross section uh, diagram, slide seven, between third level and second level, you can see that thickness of the of the yes. floor that's thick enough where that piping is inside of that concrete floor okay thank you and this is for the clarification of non-science people such as myself for your purposes recovers basically means isolate right you're isolating the highly enriched uranium y yes recovering basically taking it out of, of the the material that keel sends us and just recovering the heu in, in, in its purest form okay thank you all right carl estimate the effective remaining useful life of that facility? You know, we, we look hard at our facility every day to see if we can determine that. Um, and, and I guess that, you know, I would, I would almost turn that question around. I know 
if I want my facility to run for about another 20 years, I'm going to have to invest some money in the infrastructure. You know, if we build a new facility, it would cost us billions of dollars. So what we need to decide, it's not my decision, but if we're going to decide to process and continue processing in Eddie Canyon, then we'll need to sit down and, and talk about additional funding for infrastructure. Uh, right now, I feel I can safely operate for the fi next five to ten years with limited uh, infrastructure money. But uh, eventually, we're going to have to start uh, upgrading some of the infrastructure. Okay. Gil? Thanks for a great um, presentation. And uh, I went, when Doug was starting to ask about safety, um, and you talked about the, cor the culture of safety, just wanted to remind the board with your Canadian fuel there, I mean, it was a hot topic a few years ago about that they, there was a hot spot, is that what it was? Yeah, on one of our canisters, that those heavy shielded, what we call pigs, that we pull the canister into, one of those, when we filled those with lead, there was a small void spot, so it didn't have adequate lead shielding, and after we brought one of the canisters into that pig, uh, we do radiological surveys, and they identified a small area where we had a hot spot. And, um, and so we were able to control it, it really literally just turn it, but yes. It was, I mean, for those of you who don't remember, it was a major story in, our, in the CSRA. And when we as the cab got to be briefed and everything, how they handled it, procedure was handled to the T. It was handled perfectly. And so the culture of safety that <laughs> you're speaking of, we've witnessed firsthand in this board. So. Um, thanks, Doug, for asking. But uh, H. Canyon has been very impressive um, in everything we've seen. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Charles. Charles Hilton, CAP. It absolutely terrifies me that this is the only facility that we have in this country. I mean, it's such a national asset, <coughs> and there isn't a replacement, a plan for replacement, or anything else. I'm just curious. How many of this type facility are there in the world? Does ma every major country have one or? Um, so I'm just going from my personal experience. I do know of two. The French have one, La Hague. Um, Pakistan has one as well. Um, but there are smaller scale type ca um, facilities in lots of countries, but they're not at the size and the production level that we have in H Canyon. Maxine has said at this board meeting before, if we don't have H Canyon, we fall behind the world, third world countries. That is true. There are some third world countries that have, would have more capability of processing if we lost H Canyon. Okay. Uh, Bob? Bob Smith, CAB. Going back to the question and the comments that you just made about infrastructure, you know, you've got a 65-year-old facility with 65-year-old valves and 65-year-old pumps and motors and uh, a lot of this equipment is no longer supported by the original equipment manufacturers. So I would imagine that you've got a r repair replacement program that you're looking at, but I would think that at some point down the line we, you'd have to be looking at a fairly significant capital outlay to replace some of these valves and components that are going to wear out over time. <coughs> They're not going to last forever. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, that's not really a question, but I think the answer is, is yes, you're right. So we have been selectively replacing some components. Um, as my boss often says, we've been shaking the, the couch and getting change out of the, the cushion. So this year we've been able to uh, would I buy some replacement parts so we identify our critical spares? And, uh, but that's what the, the challenge has been for the engineering team. So if a valve is no longer supported, then the engineering team has to go out and identify a new valve. And so that's, that's impactful to the operation. So I can't just go to a shelf in my maintenance shop and pull a valve. I have to get my engineering team involved. They go out and identify a, a new component that will work. And uh, so we go through the process to make sure that uh, we do it and, and do it uh, per our requirements. But, uh, but you're right, there, you know, we're, like I said, we're able to maintain it right now, but uh, more and more parts are failing and uh, we're, we're having to find replacement parts because a lot of parts have become obsolete. 
And just to let everybody know too, we have some very resourceful engineers out there and they're experts on eBay. Yeah. So some of our parts do come from eBay. I was just gonna add, for our systems that are important to safety, what we call vital safety systems, we do performance monitoring on those systems. And we'll do periodic reports and part of that report is, what is the status of spare equipment? Are we facing obsolescence? Are we working towards prioritizing design changes so that we have the replacement equipment that is now available? And that's all part of the prioritization system that we use. So when we go to spend those limited dollars, we're making the right priority calls on the safety equipment, taking care of obsolescence, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's not a perfect solution, but it is something that is keeping our facility very viable going forward. And I apologize for not, having, you know, not stating the question, but you're right. But I guess the other thing is I would, I'm assuming that that is all rolled into your overall maintenance program and cost estimates based on long-term operating expenses would be. Is that correct? I, I mean yes, that's correct. That goes into our long-term plan and our system plan. Okay. Thank you. Jim. Jim Gielkamp. As you're looking at replacing personnel who are retiring, et cetera, what are the minimum qualifications that you're looking for or requiring in order to consider hiring someone? You know, I, and, and I didn't really talk on that, but uh, so we've implemented what they call the work keys program at the Savannah River site. So when we're, when we're hiring operators, technicians, maintenance mechanics, you know, there's basically standardized tests now that we require those individuals to take, and there's a required score before they can apply. And uh, I think our, our training department as well as our H HR department really have done a, a very good job. I have been very, very pleased with the quality of mechanics and operators that we have been bringing in. Now it still takes a number of months to get them qualified, but, but we've been, and we've also been working with our local uh, technical schools, Aiken Tech, Augusta Tech, and we actually have programs in place for, for rad inspectors, uh, what I call chemical operators or nuclear operators. And so we've also put those programs in, in place. And so they've been providing very good resources as we've been hiring these folks. Joyce? He had one earlier. We're back to you. Joyce Underwood Cab. Uh, jumping off of Bob's question about replacement parts, is it cost prohibitive to just uh, fabricate your own? Because I know you have the capabilities, or somebody does, to do machinist work or uh, use a 3D printer. It, it, you know, we'll evaluate when something fails or breaks, we evaluate what is the best route to, to get it back in service. So engineering will look at that. So and they look at all aspects. It's on the table. Yeah. Okay. And, and, there's, and there's some things like the jumpers and things like that, the those all have to be fabricated on site. Thank you. Okay. Carl? Yeah, uh, uh, Carl Sweeney, yes. Uh, regardless of age or condition, if, if there were a small accident, it w probably wouldn't take much. Wouldn't you, if it's the only facility of its type that we have complete control over, uh, wouldn't that put us out of commission for a long period of time? It just, I just wanted your comment on that kind of thing. There's no redundancy, apparently. Uh. So well, I think what we do is because of our safety culture and our, the way that the DOE order requirements are, we have to look at what accidents could occur and how do we mitigate those. So that's a lot of what Mike's folks do is they look at what could happen and how do we go and put mitigations in place. And we try to do that from things that are, don't require any human interaction so that it's passive and it just automatically happens so it's safe. Um, if we were to have an accident, it would depend on what type of accident it was for how long we were out of commission. Um, because of that hardened structure, we, we do have a lot of leeway in that. Um, leaks and things like that really aren't accidents and we can handle if we had a leak, which we, you know, we work to not have any. Um, so things like that, it would just depend on what that accident was. Right, we, for each one of the uh, scenarios that we have, we do a complete analysis, again, looking at what are the consequences of that and then what layer of controls do we need to put in place to prevent that? And so for those ones that might damage or, or affect the public, you know, you've got many layers of controls that are in place to prevent that. So you really don't have an accident that could, you know, damage the canyon walls or cause the facility to fail itself. 
But the one thing that wasn't addressed is, you know, what would be the political ramifications of if you were to have an, an, an accident in the, in the thing. The facility is designed so if something happened to, to a tank, you could replace that tank and move on, but you'd still have to work with all the other aspects of the fact that you did have that event occur in your facility. And I have redundancy in all my safety systems too. So if one system goes, you know, one, one piece of equipment goes down, I always have backup. All right. Charles. Charles Hilton, CAB. If the hot side went down for an accident, is the warm side duplicative enough you could make it a hot side or are they completely independent? They're, they're, they're really truly independent. Um, you know, I can't think of an accident scenario that would take down one side or the other. You know, you may have some equipment that goes out of service for a short period of time while we replace it, but, uh, but yeah, they're independent. So, so that's one thing that I taught. The people that designed the canyon back in the 50s were genius because every piece and part in there can be replaced remotely. So just like they said, tanks and jumpers and anything like that can be replaced inside of that facility. Carl, did you have additional questions? Nope. Okay. So let me ask this. I've noticed a little bit of shifting. We have two more presentations left. Do you want to take 10 minutes? Yes. I heard a couple of yes. Let's take 10 minutes. Let's come back at 227, be back in our seats, and we'll get the last two presentations out of the way. Okay.
Julia's ready. She knows what's up. Betty's ready to go. Jim's ready. All right, folks, let's bring it in. Let's find our seats. So we got two more presentations left. We're going to do the light Q&A in between, and then we'll do a general, trying to wrap it all up and bring it together and get, get the whole picture. Bill, you ready? Let's go, sir. All right, I'm breaking protocol a little bit by standing, but I didn't want to look back. I'm Bill Bates. I'm the Deputy Associate Lab Director for Nuclear Materials and SRNL, and wanted to show some props a little bit also. So this is an MTR, Material Test Reactor, fuel assembly that Keela and Rick both talked about. One of the more standard types, and you'll see there are certainly many different types, but one of the things I want to really start with, of all the fuel that Keela described, over 80% of the fuel is aluminum clad and not like commercial fuel like you would have at Plant Vogel or other commercial utilities that's a zircaloy type cladding or covering. Cladding really just means all the fuel and all the outer surfaces are aluminum. Everything that's exposed is aluminum in a fuel assembly like this. Um, with that, aluminum brings with it a lot of technical challenges that we will have to overcome if we ever want to seriously consider drying the aluminum clad spent fuel to be disposed of in a national repository as opposed to processing. So what I'm going to try to do is explain what some of those challenges are and what we're trying to do to better understand them to make that an option. Okay. So to start out, and I'll, I'll stand here, to start out, this is a little overview of what our process is and what it would be if we were going to dry fuel. What does this really mean to dry fuel to go to a repository? The cask you see, the big cask on the left-hand side, is the actual shipping container that we would use. It's a conceptual model graphic of one that would ultimately be used to ship the fuel from SRS to wherever that off-site repository is. Today, likely, that would be Yucca Mountain, but wherever that repository would end up being. What our process would be in the L area facility would be to take all the elements of fuel like that, carry them one at a time, take them out of the bundles like uh, Maxime showed, and put them into a basket, which is basically an open vented carrier that you would store several of these assemblies in and then place the basket in the DOE standard canister, which is what this one is shown vertically. The concept of the standard canister would allow for several baskets to be stacked on top of each other. And nothing is an absolute number, but we think on average a fuel assembly like this, we would get about 10 assemblies per basket and probably stack them with three baskets in that standard canister. So once we would load those into that canister, we would weld the lid on. There's a lid at the very top of that standard canister. It would go into a shielded cell where you would do that welding. Then you would take that canister to a location to do the leak or the the drying, rather, of any of the remaining moisture that's inside that canister. There are ports designed on the outside of that canister that would allow hookup to a drying system. So a couple facts about the standard canister. It, it's already been designed. It's already been looked at for the Yucca Mountain license. It's rated for 50 pounds per square inch, which is about one and a half times what my tires are in my car. It can handle more than that, but the actual rating and what we would have to argue against and analyze for is 50 PSI for that. And that'll be important in a few minutes when I get into it. The design for the standard canister comes in two different diameters and two different heights, 18 inch diameter and 24 inch diameter, 10 foot high and 15 feet high. And that's important because some of the different fuels are of different heights and that can provide some flexibility as well. So once it's all leak tested and inspected and done, that would then go back and get loaded into the shipping cask, either seven per cask or nine per cask, depending which diameter uh, standard canister would be used. So that's kind of the, the high level background. 
So why are we drying? That's really the crux of the technical challenge to all of this, is why are we drying and how do you dry? Um, we often use the term, how dry is dry enough? And that, that's really the, the problem statement that we have to understand. Um, what, what happens on these is you end up with really two sources of water in that standard canister. The first source is what we call freestanding liquid that might come just because we only really drip dry or would drip dry those baskets and the fuel assemblies when they come out of the basin. So you're gonna have some residual amount of water left in, in those, some that might just stick from surface tension in the various parts of the fuel assemblies. That part's pretty well understood. We, we pretty much know how to dry that and deal with that. The challenging part is the second type of water that we have in there, which we call uh, chemically bound water. Chemically bound water is what ends up on the surface of the fuels. This is really a view of one of the surface areas of a fuel assembly just like this. And those, that oxide, that surface layer oxide is really a film that builds up both during reactor operation and also in storage when it's stored in a fuel pool or even if it's stored dry once it's taken out of the reactor. Um, the, the real challenge with this is that the water is part of that film. So the amount of water that you have varies by assembly. It varies based on the history of where it was operated, how it was operated, how it was stored. And it has a big variable in it, which is how much surface area do you have on the different fuel assemblies. So we could do a lottery, but we should ask, when you look at this and you look at it lengthwise, you'll see the outside is all aluminum plates, mostly there for structural support of the fuel itself. The actual fuel is, is inside, and if you came up and looked at it, you would see about 12 fuel plates that run top to bottom, but they have an airspace in between them. All of that is exposed aluminum surface area, so all of that can build up this oxide layer. So if you took this apart and laid it out on a table, you would have close to two square yards of aluminum surface area. So we've done the math and based on some nominal amounts of film thickness and how much water is expected to be in that film thickness, we could have as much as two ounces of water in an assembly like this, chemically bound in that oxide film. So going back to the previous slide, when you remember we said we would put 30 of those into that canister and then seal it up. 30 of those at two ounces is about 60 ounces. That's a two liter bottle, two liter soda bottle worth of water that is in there. The reason that's a problem is that once it's dried and you've got the standard canister out there dried in storage or in transit, it's experiencing heat from its own assembly and heat from the other fuel assemblies, just decay heat from those assemblies from having been irradiated in the reactor. And you're also dealing with the effect of the radiation from decay of those other assemblies. So both that heat and the radiolysis from that radiation will affect that water and, and release at some rate that we don't fully understand yet, will release that water in the form of hydrogen and oxygen straight from the H2O. So the concern with releasing that hydrogen and oxygen are really the two big ones. Pressure, because we don't want to overpressurize that canister beyond 50 PSI, and flammable gas in the form of hydrogen in that oxygen environment when it gets released. So those are the two real critical parameters that we're worried about and why we have to dry it to drive off that water before we seal up the canister. As a third one, it's also important we don't want to have water left in there because that'll continue to promote corrosion and can affect the structural integrity of the fuel assembly and we don't want it to crush and deform and things like that because that's also important in several of the analyses for the repository. So just running around a couple of the pictures here. I knew it. Up here at the top, that, like I said, that's one of the surface areas. That really has two types of oxide corrosion on it. One is just the flat film on that flat surface, but it also has some nodes 
of more amplified, you can see it sticking out almost, that's right on the edge where, where the fuel plates are connected, or the, the exterior support plates, rather, come together and are connected. We believe that came from low quality storage basin water for that particular assembly. Uh, it wasn't deionized, it had a high conductivity and that's what promoted that corrosion. The one at the bottom right is one that we've recently discovered in the last couple years where what you're looking at there is sloughed off oxide material that literally came off just due to agitating the fuel and moving it around. That's looking at the bottom of one of the baskets that was used to carry that material and ship it. And when you touch it and you, you try to move that around, it, it breaks up very easily. This is not a real stubborn oxide example, but it's what some of it looks like. There are actually multiple different types of oxide. This happens to be the most prevalent. The picture here on the bottom left, you've seen that from some of the other presentations. That's the high flux isotope reactor fuel from Oak Ridge National Lab. I wanted to include that here because unlike this one that might be about two square yards of aluminum surface area, it's hard to see here, but within each one of these are hundreds of concentric fuel plates with very tight air gaps between them. If you took this all apart and we, we looked at the data to figure this out, this is about 64 square yards of surface area in a hyper fuel core. Now, kind of a good news, bad news, that's a lot of surface area, but we can only fit two or three of these in the canister anyway, just by its physical dimensions. So it's not like we would put 30 of these in the standard canister. But it is one that we have to deal with and address, and it's much different than the more standard material test reactor type plate. Okay, some other things that are different about aluminum fuel compared to commercial fuel. Um, probably most important to us for several reasons is a lot of our spent fuel, aluminum fuel, contains highly enriched uranium. All the commercial fuel Maxine mentioned earlier is only around 5% uranium enriched. That's low enriched uranium. So having a lot more uranium-235 means we're gonna have a different set of criticality analyses that we have to address for each fuel type. Each one's a different shape, each one has a different amount of uranium. They're all gonna be different. They're not as uniform as what you'll find in commercial fuel. The second item is that highly enriched uranium is proliferable. It's much more attractive to an adversary than, than low enriched uranium. So obviously that means it may have some additional security ramifications on transport, interim storage, repository storage, and handling. So that's another challenge associated with our aluminum spent fuel. Some other physical characteristics, the aluminum fuel is much more likely to have this oxide film type buildup on it than commercial fuel. There are corrosion mechanisms on commercial fuel, but not nearly to the level of aluminum, not nearly the amount of water retention that you can get chemically bound on the oxide that you'll find on aluminum fuel. The last one there is important because aluminum melts at a much lower temperature than, than a commercial fuel or a zircaloy. Something like three times higher melting temperature for a commercial assembly than for an aluminum type assembly. That's important because the main way to drive off the water from these oxide films is by heating it up. So part of our challenge is to find where is that heating point and heating duration in time that we can heat it up effectively, drive off the water, but not degrade the fuel itself by going too hot. And that's part of what we're working on right now. So going down the pictures here a little bit. I knew it. Um, up at the top, you've seen that one before. That's just a subset of the variety of different aluminum spent fuel that we have at the site. Just, just a subset. And you can see they're all different shapes, they're all different sizes, they're all different uranium enrichments after they've been operated in the reactor. The picture to the right is basically a, a standard commercial fuel form, uh, 12 by 12, 15 by 15 pin form, all the same enrichment, much more consistent and uh, more standard to deal with. 
The two pictures below it are basins, a commercial basin and our basin. Very similar, deionized water, very clean, kept very pure, run through deionizers and other systems to keep them chemically pure. Part of what's different is in the bottom. The commercial utilities already have a lot of fuel that's been dried and is parked and sitting and waiting for a repository to open to be able to ship it to them. We don't have any of that today. We do have some fuel that is dry, but it's not dry and ready to go to a repository. It's in drums. There's some at Idaho that's stored dry, but vented to atmosphere. So a completely different condition than what we're talking about with that standard canister where we would dry it deliberately to meet a repository uh, specification. So this is really getting to what are we doing about it. So everything that I've talked about up to now is basically a summary of what those technical challenge areas are for us to be able to dry aluminum fuel to ultimately get into a repository. Back in 2017, Maxine and her counterparts on, on the federal staff at Idaho National Lab really championed a study that Idaho National Lab, Savannah River National Lab also participated in, issued that report in 2017, summarizing what are these gaps in technology that need to be better understood and defined to be able to ultimately dry these to get them into a repository safely. That basically became the basis for a technology development project that started funding in 2017, 2018, and now 2019, and it's in progress to try to work on all these topics that we've just been through and, and talked about. Um, the work that's being done right now is a collaboration between Idaho National Lab and SRNL, and the last bullet is really some of those scope elements that we're working on today. Uh, the first one is really testing that wide array of different oxide layers. As I mentioned, there are different types. We, we're testing some samples from actual fuel that we got out of L area. We're testing some old aluminum pieces that were cut off that we found in the basin that had a long exposure history and that turned out to be a good sample to use. Um, we're also growing some in the lab and that's what the picture on the top right is. You, we can grow some of these oxides in the lab. So we're doing some of that and comparing the, under the microscope, what does the structure of these oxides look like and how much water does it hold, that sort of thing. You can also buy it commercially if any of you want to buy aluminum oxyhydroxide. Uh, you can find it and buy it. Um, and it's unirradiated clean and so on. Uh, modeling is being done by Idaho National Lab right now. They're doing some simulation and modeling, particularly of how aluminum and water react, what some of those chemical reactions are and how they occur at different temperatures. The third bullet, we've started doing some heating tests, but we're only at the very beginning to understand where do you start to drive off the hydrogen and the oxygen and what pressures are you seeing when you put it at, at temperature. And we're planning to go forward and do irradiation tests with a cobalt source irradiator to do that same thing and see how much hydrogen, how much oxygen can we drive off at different um, dose rates. And then lastly, where we are planning for this to go in the future is pursuit of actual drying tests. There are two different types of drying, vacuum drying and a type of drying that forces hot air or hot inert gas in through what would be the, the standard canister. And that work is gonna be done by Holtec Corporation and the University of South Carolina. So that will feed into the knowledge that tries to close in these gaps to ultimately give us a defensible understanding of what would it take to do this, to do it safely, and can we do it economically? And I'll, I'll close with this. We're pretty confident that we can do this safely, but if you can only do one fuel assembly per canister, that's not gonna be economical. That's an extreme case, but that's part of what this all comes down to is can we do it in a way that makes sense as an alternative disposition option, okay? So with that, I'm all done. All right, folks. Any questions for Mr. Bates? Dave. 
Dave Vlogas, Cap. So is there a, a fair amount of uh, maintenance involved in uh, uh, the, uh, the dry storage? You, uh, you talked about the uh, corrosion issues and uh, uh, the uh, maintaining the, uh, or, or do you have to maintain the 50 uh, pounds per square inch of uh, air pressure? Is that something like, yeah, just like you check your tires on your vehicle, do you have to do the, the same here? Or? Part of what we're looking at going forward would be a demonstration where we would use that type of canister but have it instrumented. In fact, we've already developed the conceptual design for the lid that would do a lot of monitoring of what's going on inside that canister. So that would be the next step after what I talked about here on this last slide. And out of that would come really a, a decision on whether there's some type of long-term surveillance that would be done perhaps to periodically monitor pressure in the canister while it's in storage before going to the repository. We, we haven't gotten that far down the track yet. Okay. <coughs> Dave Isley. Dave Isley, CAB. Thank you, Bill. Um, your Envision transportation package, is that envisioned to be a type B? Uh, yes. But it's it, it hasn't been certified, hadn't no. been designed. It's only conceptual design conceptual. today. The standard canister, however, the one that's vertical on that first slide, has been designed. Okay, you're talking about the 3 8 wall, but that's not a type B, that's just an inner. Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, Joyce? Joyce Underwood Cab. I was listening, but my brain hurts now, so this is a clarification. The corrosion is inside the canister, not getting out of the canister? Right. The corrosion today is on the actual fuel assemblies. Which is inside the bigger thing. Today, these fuel assemblies are mostly stored in the bundles, like Maxine showed earlier, in the basin, in the water. So the corrosion does not pose any sort of a risk to the workers? No, not, not today. It, it, the, the main concern with it is what do you do with drying and will it eventually cause a structural uh, concern with the fuel assembly itself? Will it remain strong and, and intact for handling? Okay, so if a worker did come in contact with this corrosion for any reason, is it caustic to people? Okay. Oh, did we press? I'm sorry. sorry. So the operators would not have contact with the fuel. It's all underwater. Oh. Um, and the corrosion, so we do have a program within El Area called our Augmented Monitoring and Condition Assessment Program. And they're actually going through and they're pulling out fuel assemblies in the underwater. All this is underwater. And they're going to be able to take video and pictures with a grid and then they can come back in five years and do the same thing or in a year to see if that corrosion is actually getting worse. Um, because of our water quality in El Basin, we do not have large amounts of corrosion. Most of the fuels that come to us are already corroded and we put them in special kind, the special buckets to try to isolate them from the rest of the basin water. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from around the table? Betty. Betty Cook Cab. I just have one question and thank you so much for the presentation. When we went on a tour and observed the water where it was an open area that we could walk around the water and, and saw the tanks emerge, is that water changed out or does that water remain the same? The water is not changed out per se. We do send it through filters to clean it and it's recycled. However, uh, we do have some evaporation. So we do have to add water periodically. So in that sense of it, you don't continuously have the same water. Thank you. That's what I was wondering about. Sometimes you have something that the water collects, like even dust and all, and I, I have to compliment you. Everything is so clean. But I know that there's some, sometimes the water gets um, messed up, so to speak. But you're saying you do filter it and put it back in. Yeah, we send it to two different types of filters. So we send it through a sand filter, and we also send it through an iron exchanger. Thank you. Okay. All right. 
Doug. Uh, Doug Howard Cap. Uh, very good presentation. I think when we went on our tour, you all explained to us that you do have dive teams that go under there to do to work periodically. So, so in the past, we have had some divers, their nuclear qualified divers have gone into the basin to check some of the, we had a sealant that was put on the concrete walls just to check some of that. Um, it's not a routine thing that we do, so we haven't done it probably in the last uh, eight to 10 years. Thank you. All right, any other questions around the table? All right, thanks Bill. Eloy, you ready? Got it. Now you got it. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eloy Salivar. I'm with SRNS. Um, not with the Chamber of Commerce, but I wanted to welcome you to Augusta and Columbia County. If you can get a chance to walk outside, you ought to do that. It's a really pretty setting out there. I do uh, I have a really cool job. I do life cycle in state planning for environmental management operations. It consists of six primary facilities that are on this gear chart behind us. Um, uh, the, Probably the bigger ones are, are H and L that you got to hear from to today. Today, but we also heard from F 235F this morning. So F H L H B line K and E are the six facilities that I, I do this life cycle planning for. Uh, I think we've mastered a, a pretty good way to create a baseline for that life cycle planning, and we call it a system plan, uh, environmental management operations system plan. We're currently sitting on Rev Zero. Maxine presented it to you in Savannah last year. Hopefully you still have a copy of it. Um, we're in the works, in the throes of a Rev 1. And uh, when I say Rev 1, uh, what I would describe and the things that drive a Rev are things like uh, the nuclear, nuclear material inventory that you have today, the current inventory, uh, what the facility's capabilities are. You asked Rick a bunch of questions about how long can the canyon run. That gets factored into the life cycle planning uh, planned inventory, what's coming to us from other foreign countries or other domestic uh, research reactors, we look at that uh, frequently. Operating scenarios, those come up routinely uh, as to different ways to approach, and I'm actually going to talk to you about how we looked at H Canyon. Uh, that's the primary purpose for this conversation. What are the things that you can do uh, from an overview perspective of what the canyon's capabilities are for for the, the life cycle. And then the most important thing, uh, per this gear chart, I love this cheer, gear chart behind us, those, all of those facilities and entities outside of Savannah River site have to work together through throughputs, through shipping arrangements, mem memorandum, memorandum of understandings so that everybody's working together. You adjust or tweak any one of those and it changes the outcome. It changes your life cycle. So with that, I wanna show you a list of acronyms that you can just use that later. Where am I pointing to? Any place. Any place? The top one? Middle. No, middle. Middle. Got it. So th you can use those acronyms for later. Okay, when you think about H Canyon and life cycle, uh, it's really basically just four questions that you need to answer. How fast do you run the canyon? How long? What do you feed the canyon for processing? And then what product do you produce? So all of this is documented in our system plan. Uh, if you operate at the pace that Rick was talking to you that he operates today, it's, it's five, 6.4 D dissolver uh, equivalent dissolutions a year. Uh, that's in a series kind of an operation. If you take it in a modeling space for time and motion, if you add a little bit of online sampling, you can actually streamline that process, add some parallel ops, and do as much as 15 dissolutions, 6.4 D dissolution a year. So that's a 3X uh, range in canyon operations. And I'll talk to you about the, the process of how we picked uh, which option to choose. From a what do you operate, how long do you operate? Uh, Maxine and others have talked about the amended record of decision. Keila was talking about that. Uh, the current one that we have today, the 1000 MTR 200 hyper, uh, if you're operating at a fast pace, that's a 2024 finish line for us. You could stop the canyon then. You could do the dry storage approach that Bill Bates just talked to you about. Once that technology is validated, you'll have that done by 2027. 
so that you could stop the canyon operation then and proceed to dry storage. You could also operate uh, all the way to 2030, which is when the tank farm will separate from the canyon and then stop your operations then so you won't have to build an alternative high level waste process. Or you could process all of the spent nuclear fuel, which is a 2040 mark, aluminum based fuel. So, so you got a couple of stopping points that you could look at in terms of how long. Uh, what do you feed it? Uh, Rick covered all of this and I think um, Keela did also. The MTR, HIFR, TRM, ATR, didn't talk about it too much. That's the Idaho, when you hear about the Idaho swap, that's the advanced test reactor fuel, 4,000 bundles coming this way and then we'll send them 2,000 stainless steel zirconium fuel bundles uh, for dry storage in their facilities. So you could, you could take that approach for feed uh, and then this Japanese fuel that you heard about uh, that could come, that could also, well it's actually here, uh, we're just looking at the ways to process it in a canyon through the electrolytic dissolution. What do you produce? Uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, we started producing 4.95% low enriched uranium. So we can continue that campaign or you could shift to this 19.75% high SALEU that we've been talking to you about. That's a different spec, totally different flow sheet, uh, but it could be done. So when you look at those questions and, being, and considering the fact that you're, you're going to run the canyon unless you change the law that Maxine was talking about, uh, we've got to ensure high state of readiness in perpetuity. So when you think about those questions, you say, okay, I need to get some clarity. So I've documented it in a system plan. Maxine showed you this diagram earlier in section on a poster behind us also. The scenarios that we talked about are in that right-hand side of the, of the poster, or the, the decisions that we talked about are on that right-hand side. So we packaged this, uh, attached it, uh, an action memo to it, issued that to EM1, and in addition to that, held a technical forum in Augusta, uh, the latter part of last year. And we had a conversation with EM1 staff, uh, two, three, and five were there, and we described this system plan approach to them and uh, what occurred was uh, kind of the bottom right there. DOE, we, we showed them these, uh, these options, a comparison of these options, and DOE formed an integrated project team to go look at these options that I'm gonna walk you through some of the details here in a second. They, they formed an integrated project team to go look at these options and maybe even some additional options. So there's still, still some work to follow on there. But this is how we basically picked the path in our system plan rev zero. And so I picked a couple of five uh, selection criteria, there are more, there are many more than, than the five on display here. But I wanted to walk you through, <clears throat> you can see across the top, uh, the A-rod that I was talking about, time frame, dry storage, high level waste, and then all spent nuclear fuel. If you consider those the options or the paths and applied a selection criteria like spent nuclear fuel processing, uh, and I'll just walk across that lane. So you can see that you leave bundles, you leave more bundles and cores as time goes on. Uh, the earlier you stop the canyon operations, the more bundles and cores you leave to dry store. And you'll see the impact of that in terms of dollars at the bottom and time. Uh, the only one that actually uh, dispositions all the fuel is a 2040 path in red. Then you looked at, when you look at money, it's essentially the same. It's a wash in terms of five dissolution and 15 dissolution a year ops. Uh, the only difference for the all spent nuclear fuel 2040 mark is that you will not be able to produce, uh, you will not finish in 2040 at that slow pace, that five, uh, sorry Rick, it, I know it's, it's not that slow. Uh, five dissolutions a year, you can't accomplish it for that kind of a dollar amount. Uh, so you can see the different, uh, the dollar variations there. I got an uh, annotation on the, the all spent nuclear fuel, the 270 million a year. Down at the bottom, it, it notes two, 350 million a year. That includes an alt high level waste system and parallel ops. So that's why it's actually a 350 mark that we would pursue for that. Uh, waste management, the first three alternatives, you actually finish before high level waste finishes its separation. So you wouldn't have to build that project, but you would for the red all SNF, you'd actually have to, to build it or spend that $820 million for alternative high level waste system. 
Uh, for long-term storage, uh, you can see the price tag for uh, dry storage is higher the earlier you stop. The 1.3 billion, if you stopped in 2024, all the way to the right, uh, you don't spend a dime on dry storage or long-term storage. You finish all the spent nuclear fuel processing. And in terms of du uh, duration of operation, the first three there, first three options uh, show a 2059 date, and that's the documented integrated life cycle cost estimate uh, from DOE, where that's when the dry storage facility would ship to the new federal repository when it's identified that Maxine was talking about. In the case of all spent nuclear fuel, everything's gone, no need to dry store or ship to a repository. So that's, that's my wrap up for system planning. So let me kind of summarize everything and then we'll go to full questions. So you've got to hear what we do in L area, how we do it in uh, H Canyon. You have heard what it takes to do dry storage and then Eloy's given you the options that we've looked at. And, and so a couple of things I want to point out. This table, these are the, for dry storage, this is our best estimate right now. It's based on a 2012 study that was done by the lab. We do know that there are some things that have come up since that time that would cause these numbers to go up. We don't know how high, but they would go up for dry storage. Um, the canyon, you've expressed some concerns about the canyon. I do want to emphasize that that canyon basically was fully replaced inside um, in the 80s. They had a major infrastructure upgrade. They went through in place, like we talked about, the, the cranes and things like that. That's, that's the beauty of that facility, is that it can be upgraded with the, the equipment inside of it. And the way that we operate at Savannah Riverside is we never operate at our max. We always have contingency. We always operate at a lower level, with, whether it's pressure or temperature or whatever. We're always going to have a contingency mark in there that we use for our safety so that we never have to approach those accidents or anything like that that happens. We have that contingency factor in all of our operations. So what we've brought to you is everything that we know about our facilities and what's coming in, and we'd like to get your opinion of what option do you think makes the most sense from a public's perspective. Um, we all have our own individual beliefs of what we would like to do, um, but we want to get a consolidated cab opinion on what you think is the right thing to do with this facility. So that's what we're asking for you to go back in your committees and come up with. Okay, and with that, we'll turn it over to questions. Yes. Sure. Go ahead, Keely. Okay. Since there was a couple of questions on corrosion, I'd like to just go back and, and kind of add a little bit more clarity to that. We kind of gave answers and uh, a little bit of a fragmented response, but I want to help put the concern together for you. So there's actually two concerns, but related when it comes to corrosion. One, some of the fuel that we have in the basin was packaged in the 1960s. So it's been sitting in water um, all of that time. So we're monitoring that as uh, Maxine mentioned, the AMCAP program. We're monitoring the condition of that to make sure that the cladding is still holding up and we, we know what the condition of that fuel is. Um, as we go through our safety bases and our calculations um, in regards to that. So to summarize that, we are very much interested in the integrity of the fuel that we have in the basin in, in regards to that. And that actually affects what Bill Bates is doing as far as his studies. So the second concern with corrosion and to summarize what Bill was alluding to, uh, with the oxide layer on the aluminum, if you put it into an enclosed container for a long period of time, you could have some flammability concerns there because of the mixture of the, the water, the hydrogen, the oxygen, and the radiation coming off, the heat coming off of the material. So that's what Bill was alluding to. But if we decide to go with dry storage, and the fuel assemblies are in poor condition because of corrosion, that's further evaluation that Bill would have to do to make sure that we're still within our safety requirements. So there are two separate concerns, but they are related. 
um, when it comes to corrosion. And Bill, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add add to that, but okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's start with Dave Isley. Dave Isley, Cab, thanks a lot for this presentation. I really like this whole panel thing. We're all looking at each other. You got all the experts there. So, uh, mm. James, you know, it, this is the, the new thing. I like it anyway. <laughs> um, Bill, you, you, we talked earlier about the uh, all the technical challenges, and I'm quite sure they can be overcome, and you can do all that. I don't for a minute believe any of those numbers up there. I think it's going to be way more than that. The angst that I have, and probably most of the people on the cab, is that is not a disposition path. You can't tell me where you're going to put these things in the end. And I, I think that's the real rub with, with the whole dry storage. It's been that way all along. Technical issues you can always overcome as long as you've got plenty of money. But I, I, I do believe that's, that's the hard point that I have with, with the whole thing. And, uh, Money aside, you keep that canyon going until there's nothing left to dispose of. Just me. Thanks again. Gil. So thank you all very much, and um, and for all the insight in H Canyon. We, I mean, I understand. I mean, I think, I think. Um, so as we get ready to go back and talk about this in the nuclear materials committee is it pie in the sky or not to think that H Canyon needs to be replaced or a new one be built so I mean it's there's always an option to have a new facility um, my personal opinion not a DOE opinion DOE is not very good at new facilities because it's lots of money um, lots of new re um, requirements um, these are first of a kind sometimes facilities that they're they're going after so it's difficult to get those implemented in the original estimates in your original schedules so I, I think that's I don't wouldn't say it's pie in the sky but it's very difficult to get done in our current situations my thought thanks and my thought process from a cab standpoint is I thank you for all the I don't think it replaces what we've talked about today. I think it, what we have is something that needs to be done. But is it a jumping off point for the Savannah Riverside Citizens Advisory Board to say this is something we see? Because in listening to y'all and listening to the great job you've done with the facility that's been around for 70, if it was 65. 65, sorry. You know, I only do math for a living. Um, 65 years. It's, it's, it's really remarkable. We were, uh, another cab member and I were talking during the break about how remarkable it's been what's gone on in the foresight that was put into H. Cannon in 1953 when it was being designed that we're still being able to do what we do in it. But as the infrastructure and we know it's concrete and we know it's dealing and there's going to be degradation and there's going to be issues, I mean, is it something that, you know, we're, I mean, we were talking about 235F earlier, and we're, go we're going to 2040. Is it safe for us to say that HKN is going to be operating at full capacity in 22 years, 21 years? I think that's the only way that we could say that is if we knew what our funding levels were going to be. Um, if we were given the funding to do the infrastructure and the maintenance that we know that's needed to keep that facility going, we could do that. But it, without knowing what those funding levels are, we can't make that decision today. Thank you. Mike Nicolaitis, DOE, I'd like to expand. I think Rick made that, made a point to, or pretty much answered that question. He's, con he's not concerned with the next 10 years of operating with the systems the way they are, but I think to answer your question in the long term, it, it depends upon whether the, the country's willing to invest in in restoring the infrastructure like we did back in the 80s because periodically you have to rebuild the internal systems and if it could operate much longer than that but it, it depends upon a cost benefit of whether the country wants to invest in this or abandon the capability altogether or build a new capability and that's that's kind of what I think the department's looking at in the, in the strategic sense now all right Dan Dan Kaminsky cab 
Um, so it sounds like what Maxine just said, you've already identified the infrastructure improvements and ongoing support it's going to need. So uh, subsequently, I'm assuming you got a timeline for those and what your budgetary needs would be? Yes. Is, is that un included in basically the quarter billion a year operation mm -hmm. cost here? It's in the 2040 numbers that are down there for the 2040 scenario. It's included in that uh, 270 and then that 350 because 350 ties back to the placemat, which would allow us to do the infrastructure and the alternate high-level waste disposition option. Okay, so that B option, you have to go to the footnote to understand the 350? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and then just, you had identified uh, smaller scale systems that do some or all of the mission possibilities for H Canyon globally. Um, are, are those economically feasible as a backup or, or for future operations? So I don't know a lot of details of how those smaller facilities operate, but they would have to be made to work under our regulations, which I don't know if they could. And then I guess just from a, a perspective of scale, we had a clean sheet of paper today and no H Canyon today. Did it need to be that big? No, not today, not with the missions we have now. It doesn't need to be that big. And then it was built for when we were doing production of nuclear materials. And then from a practical standpoint of the, the functionality and the, um, the flexibility of the canyon, uh, certainly you, you don't really need all that space if you're doing smaller batches, right? I mean, it's, you, you can have as small of a operation inside of it as you need it or as large of one as you need it, right? So n not necessarily inside the canyon, but those, those types of operations that we do within the canyon can be on a smaller scale in a different facility, if that's what you're asking. Could they not, like as you replace things inside the canyon, could they be on a smaller scale inside the canyon as well? Assuming the infrastructure part of it, the piping through the walls and such was all intact and able to be used. Yeah, I think our problem is there's certain uh, spots for tanks and the tanks have to be certain height and in order to fit up with all of the piping in there. So we're, we're kind of constrained on our physical shape that, can, that basically ties us to the sizes that we have to have. Okay. I mean, and you, then, could, uh, you just could do a complete remodel of a cell, but that would be a very expensive proposition. So I think you would be better served using the existing footprint, if you will, and replacing the piece, the components as they no, fail absolutely. versus That's trying to redesign. Wondering what the flexibility was on that. Thanks. I mean, you, you could if you wanted to. It would be an expensive proposition. Yep. Yeah. All of it's expensive. <coughs> um, and then uh, one question on the number of uh, dissolutions. Like how many fuel canisters is that per dissolution? So if we're talking. Because I'm disillusioned right now. For one dissolution, if you're talking hyper, it's five cores. If you're talking uh, material test reactor, then it's 12 bundles. Thank you. All right. Patty? It's really, well, it's really 24 bundles because right. we do everything in 6-4 equivalents. So it's really 24 bundles of MTR fuel. All right, go. Thank you, Betty Cook Cab. I was just wondering, and, and it's a wonderful presentation, but you know, this from just the public point of view, a lot of times the public only knows what they read in the paper. Does that make sense? And mm -hmm. just like a few months ago when they had made this big article about the hairline leak type thing, would it not be a good idea to write something up in the positive, like the safety record, how well the operation is going, and maybe just a little story about in the 50s when the plant started, just some positive news instead of negative. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am, and we do have organizations on site that do try to put those positive news stories out. Um, so they are, there are groups that we, we do try to put those news um, articles out into the public. Thank you. Doug? Doug Howard-Camp. I do like the, the panel, and I think it's a great idea, and hopefully we'll continue to do it this way. And thanks for you all coming out. Uh, the question I have, and I hope it's not out of bounds in any way, but the, uh, the future pit production, will it have any kind of impact or effect on what you all are doing? 
So the future pit production is an NSA program, so it would be under a different organization and uh, funded differently than what our nuclear materials are. Now, whether or not they need to use some of our facilities is yet to be determined. Thank you. And then AK, I believe you were next. AK Hassan, KF. Um, I'm just curious if you're concerned about um, the evolving of a conversation in terms of um, if the CAB recommends reconfiguration of H Canyon to meet the various missions and um, realizing that such a conversation could lead to possibly saying when it gets to a certain cost projection that it may be better to go for new construction. On the other side of that, if the CAB took the position of saying we promote new construction, that it might insinuate that we're implying that H Canyon is in some way headed toward obsolescence, and as a result, the, the conversation becomes one of closure. So, uh, 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 so I'm just wondering, are you concerning about those uh, the conversation evolving one way or the other? Uh, uh, should we just be primarily focused on reconfiguration? So the cab's um, welcome to go in any direction that you all vote on. Um, we're willing to uh, take on any suggestions that come to us. The closure of H Canyon is not something we don't go through. We, we talk about that on a yearly basis because it will take some time to do that because of the law. It would have to get through Congress. Um, and which would also have to involve our Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board because they were the ones that helped institute that law. Um, so it w it's going to be a, a huge public discussion if we do go down the path of shutting down H Canyon. So if that's what the board chooses, then we'll go down that path as well to look at it. Okay. Joyce? Joyce Underwood Cab, and I'm sorry, I'm real stuck on that law. So I have a couple of more questions. Um, in your citation, it has two different dates, October 30th, 2000, and November 24th, 2003. So originally it wasn't 50 USC 2633. It started out as public law 106 and then 108. So it was in the appropriation bills of those years. And then it was codified into the 50 USC code uh, 2633. So that's why you see the multiple dates. Okay. My reason for asking that, there was a real big date in between those two other dates. And I'm wondering if that date made it change from one to the other. Mm, not that I know of. Not that you know of. Well, my second question is this. what Readiness for what? Why is it worded that way? What, what does that mean? Readiness for dis to, to do the processing of H Canyon. So... The, and the thought was at the time that we needed to have the capability to, to handle any nuclear materials. If we had a nuclear material that was in an unstable form that the country needed to deal with, H Canyon needed to be ready to take that on and put it in a stable form. Okay, that makes sense, because I'm reading that like readiness for something bad to happen. Oh, no. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Bob? Bob Smith, Cab. Uh, going back to a comment that Michael just made rel relative to Rick's confidence or comfort with uh, 10 years of operation versus 22 years of operation, do we have an idea of what the cost would be should we do the revamp of the H Canyon like we did back in the 80s? I think our system plan, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it assumes about $100 million a year in infrastructure uh, and maintenance activities to get us to the state that would be at a, a comfortable re, uh, facility where we wouldn't, ha we wouldn't have as much degraded infrastructure. We would be attacking that infrastructure if we had that $100 million. Okay, so then that is... $2.2 billion over, over a 22-year period? Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, if it's over 22 year, years, yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions from around the table? Gil. 
So, oops, sorry. So we found out yesterday that the, um, the, the budget came out so we can see. So we see that, we saw that advanced manufacturing is a collaboration. Collaborative. Collaborative, I was close. Mm -hmm. The AMC is funded in the president's budget request for $50 million. And that, is that coming out of H Canyon? Uh, you would have to ask OMB. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm at liberty to answer that question. Uh, uh, two completely separate issues. Yeah. Two separate things? Okay. Um, we're all for AMC. We think it's a great idea. <laughs> I am. But I, you know, moving forward in this funding issue, because I mean, it seems every time we talk H Canyon, it's always funding. And we, we understand the importance of H Canyon. And I guess that's what we're going to talk about nuclear materials, huh, Charles? All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mike Money Dewey. Hey, w when you talk about this, uh, I think you, you got to kind of answer two questions. The first question is advice around this law. The law is not designed to keep H Canyon open. The law is designed to provide the nation with the capability to do chemical separations of the spent nuclear fuel. So the first question is, do, does the nation need to have the capability to process spent nuclear fuel in a manner like we do today? If the answer is yes, then what's the best way to do it? Build a new facility, refurbish H Canyon, whatever it is, right? If the answer is no, then it's just a question of how do we most effectively disposition the material we have and, and take care of the material that we produce in the future, like Kuiper. So um, it's really about the capability, not about H Canyon per se. Any other thoughts, folks? Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you coming up. Thank you. Okay. We're running a little bit early, and that's good. We seem to recover all the time that we needed. So up next, we have public comments. We have one person signed up. You also want to sign up as well? All right, so let's divide the time between the two folks that we know that we have. Let's start with Suzanne Rhodes. Thank you very much. I'm Suzanne Rhodes, representing the State League of Women Voters. Uh, we've been watching Savannah River site for 40 years, longer than I have been, well, may, or at least been active. Um, our concerns are basically two. One of them is those darn tanks, which incidentally, I have troubles with those kind of numbers, but they're about the size of an Olympic, full-size Olympic pool, and they're older than most people in this room. And I'm thrilled that finally, there's some measurable progress gonna be made with the tanks in terms of cesium removal and ultimate closure. And we're eagerly looking for uh, a schedule but I understand things are gonna start at the end of this year, which is great. Uh, our other concern is um, the constant bringing in, or suggesting to bring in foreign wastes that can be managed safely wherever they are now, particularly uh, Germany and Canada. Um, we're kind of against it for a couple reasons. One is somehow or other shipping never seems to be a problem. Uh, shipping is not one of our huge concerns, by the way. It's an environmental interest-raising issue, but um, not particularly ours, except that it's so easy to send stuff here. And we are very pessimistic about any plan passed here, which is part of the reason we're against bringing in other wastes. Um, the Yucca Mountain thing I think is really deader than a doornail for political reasons, if not technical. Nevada doesn't want it, and they seem to have the clout. Um, so for that reason, we don't want more waste here, and partly for that reason, we're against the pits, which would bring in pl more plutonium, 